For many years, those of us with autism have often done our best to keep up with modern research and ideas regarding our differences. Occasionally we'll read of an observation made or a research paper published which makes us jump up in a personal Eureka moment. It may be something we had thought of ourselves for a long time, or it may be something completely new to us that closely resembles our lived experience. One of these moments that struck many of us was when we realised that sensory difficulties we had experienced all our lives were finally being taken seriously by the research and medical establishment. Whilst it has yet to be incorporated into the forthcoming ICD-11 diagnostic process, sensory differences are now recognised as a key feature of autistic lives. What exactly are they and how do they impact on our lives? Sensory difficulties come in two forms. Hypersensitivity describes a situation where one or more of our senses is overstimulating to us. Hyposensitivity is the opposite. It is not being sufficiently stimulated by a certain sense, so that we must be vigilant in order to compensate. Before we discuss how we can process our sensory inputs differently, we need to take a close look at what senses actually are. Since the very first natural philosophers tried to make sense of the world, we assumed there to be five senses. Sight, sound, smell, touch and taste. Mm. It's so deeply ingrained in our cultures that the phrase sixth sense is still in common usage and was even the title of a hit movie. We now know that five was a huge underestimate and that there are at the very least dozens of identifiable senses. The jury is still out on the exact number, but the notion that we just have five ways of receiving information about our environment and our bodies is now consigned to history. Take for example proprioception, which tells us how our body is positioned. Pain is a sense, temperature sensitivity is a sense, even balance is a sense of how gravity and motion affect us. To that we can add other less obvious perceptions such as hunger, fatigue, itching, nausea and many, many others. The classical quintuplet of senses are sensations which tell us about the world around us or external senses. But the modern understanding of senses also includes those which tell us about the inner workings of our bodies or internal senses. In scientific terms we call it perception and interoception. Hunger tells us we need to eat, thirst to drink, a nausea that we are unwell or have consumed something bad for us. There is variation in the sensitivity of the organs which provide sensory feedback to our brains throughout humanity. But the differences within autistic minds seem to be concerned more with how our brains process that information. Hypersensitivity is when one or more of our senses can cause us distress, even pain, when subjected to certain stimuli. It's not just about the amplitude of these stimuli though. In many cases it's particular varieties of stimuli that can make our lives difficult. In some cases it may be because we lack the ability to ignore or filter out sensations that neurotypical people find easier to put out of their minds. A good example is fluorescent lights. Many autistic people find them difficult to be around because they cause sensory distress. The first is that they make a buzzing noise which most people can't seem to hear, but to the autistic who can, it can be an interminable drone they cannot filter out, like a distant car alarm that goes on and on without anyone turning it off. In addition, fluorescent tubes do not emit a constant light, they flicker. It's incredibly fast and most people don't seem to notice it, but even some neurotypical people do. For some of us, it's impossible to function just because of the flickering alone, inducing headaches and worse. But if you can hear the buzzing too... The question we haven't yet solved is whether people who can sense these things and are consciously aware of them are processing the information received by the brain more clearly, or are we failing to filter it out like everyone else does? To take the example of hearing, simply because it's something I can talk about from a personal perspective. 
My hearing is no better than anyone else's. In fact, my wife is far more sensitive to noise in general than I am. On a hearing test, she would likely perform better than I do. I do have a particular set of sensitivities though, which have both positive and negative implications for me. For me, it's human voices. I've always been very good at recognising people's voices. Many a time we'll watch something on television and I'll recognise an actor by their voice, despite only ever having seen them in heavy makeup, playing an alien character on something like Star Trek. People ask me how I do it, but it never seemed unusual to me until it was pointed out to me. When I'm feeling strong, I find myself able to hear and follow several conversations at once. That can be inconvenient for people who make disparaging comments on the assumption that they can't be heard. On the other hand, that can be distressing. There's a cliche about the intense discomfort many people feel at the sound of fingernails being drawn down a blackboard. When I am under the weather or tired, I cannot filter out the voices around me, but my ability to distinguish between them is lost. It becomes a cacophony, a mess of voices which makes it difficult for me to concentrate on the one I need to. Certain frequencies can be jarring too, even painful for me. In particular, the voice people use for baby talk can drive my brain close to meltdown very, very quickly. Like most of us on the spectrum, my hypersensitivities go far beyond just human voices. But I use those as a simple illustration of how a sensitivity can be both an asset and a deficit. So that's hypersensitivity. But what about its opposite, hyposensitivity? To be hyposensitive is to have a lesser perception of sensory stimuli. And just like hypersensitivity, it may have little to do with the functional efficiency of these sensory organs and have more to do with how our brains process the information it receives. In terms of sound, it may be a difficulty in appreciating music or distinguishing people's voices. It may be even that distinguishing the different sounds of speech does not come easy. In visual terms, it could be a difficulty perceiving fast moving objects, spotting differences or objects in our peripheral vision. Objects may be seen as outlines or coloured shapes lacking detail. It's quite common for autistic people with hyposensitivities in the external senses to become highly interested, even obsessed, with seeking stimuli for those senses. Someone with hyposensitive hearing may try very hard to experience sounds, even become very noisy in their behaviour or activity to gain more stimulation. Hyposensitivity can also disrupt our internal senses too. Internal senses are vital for us to regulate body functions and to mitigate danger. If someone misinterprets or has reduced sensitivity to pain or even certain kinds of pain, it may lead to injury or illness being undiagnosed. Lack of sensitivity to nausea may lead to poisoning or a poor sense of proprioception could make us clumsy and uncoordinated. To use myself as an example again, I have hyposensitivities to both hunger and fatigue. In both cases, I have no sense of proportion, only a black and white on or off sense. And even then, I can be known to not realise even when it's gone too far. I'm never peckish or a bit hungry. I'm either not hungry or ravenous. And when I'm tired or depressed, I may not even recognise the need to eat at all. Neither do I get a bit tired. I either feel alert and okay, or I'm utterly exhausted. Over the years, I've come to recognise my hyposensitivities and learn to compensate. I can regulate the calories and the types of food I eat to ensure I get what I need and when I need it. I can make sure I go to bed at a sensible time and get enough sleep to function without the risk of sudden exhaustion at an inopportune moment. For most of us, hyposensitivities can be worked around. But we can only do so when we realise that the way we feel or process these senses is different to how the majority of people experience them. Because of this, it's vital that we talk to people or seek counselling to discern the differences in our personal sensory universes. 
Providing we know where we need to keep an eye on things, and if we need them, the people who support us do too. Any potential problems they may cause can be kept to a minimum. But it's also important to know so that we can maximise the benefits of our hypersensitivities. Being able to hear certain things more acutely, see details others miss, or taste subtleties that pass other people by, not only enriches our lives, but it can be of great use to society if applied to professions that make use of them. As is often the case, if society at large were able to understand the range and potential, it would not only benefit autistic people by creating a safer, more accepting environment, it can benefit both businesses and society at large by making use of the positive differences. If you'd like to tell us about your own experiences of hyper or hyposensitive senses, then please let us know in the comments below. And remember, however intense your experience of the world, whichever of your senses works for or against you, you're not just autistic, because every day can be an autistomatic day. If you would like to join us on our exploration of Asperger's and autism and the way it continues to colour the lives of adults and young people throughout life, then please like our videos, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to be kept up to date with new content.